Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of The Village Square. And on behalf of The Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us tonight for After Babel, the fragmentation of everything with our very special guest, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Before we introduce John, I'm excited to introduce the one and only Corey Nathan, who will facilitate tonight's conversation with me. Corey launched his career as a stockbroker by day while studying at a theater conservancy at night, a beginning that captures something pretty essential about Corey's life ever since. Raised in an observant Jewish household, Corey became a born-again Christian in his late 20s. This unique trajectory required engaging in fraught conversations about religion with his family, as well as strained discussions in the church about politics. So it really only made sense that Corey is now the host of the podcast, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. And it's probably also not a big surprise that someone introduced Corey to <laughs> us <laughs> and, and that we sweet talk Corey into hosting Village Squarecast as well. So if you're a Village Squarecast listener, you should be, um, you are officially looking at the face behind our voice. Corey, welcome. Thank you so much. And apologies for this face. As my uh, my Aunt Ida used to call me Facha Bruta, which I thought was a sweet name that she, her pet name for me, but it's re it really means Italian. It's Italian for monster face. So that's, you're welcome. Oh, oh that, is, that is just wrong, Corey. That is wrong. Um, so I wanted to know, is there a difference between fraught conversations and strained discussion? <laughs> um, I... I have to think about that. Maybe that's a chapter in our shared book together. But I do know that fraught and strange are both necessities for good chicken soup. How's that? <laughs> All right. I think that's right. All right. Cueing Corey. He's going to help me with the introduction. Thank you. Thank you. This program is made possible by funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the United We Stand Connecting Through Culture Initiative. It's part of a multi-year series of digital programs, Unum, Democracy Reignited, presented in partnership with Florida Humanities, exploring the past, present, and future of the American idea as it exists on paper, in the hearts of our people, and as it manifests in our lives. A disclaimer tonight that is particularly important because Corey Nathan is co-facilitating. <laughs> Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities, or maybe even mine. Should I say that, Corey? <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> we got our bases covered. <laughs> if you are not familiar with the work of NEH and Florida Humanities, we're putting their web addresses in chat. Be sure to check them out. The chat window will be closed tonight, but you can ask questions at any time during the program. You can start asking them right away by clicking on the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Heights, many fans and colleagues who I know are with us tonight to share their appreciation for John in the Q&A and we'll copy them and we'll pass them along to John later on so he knows you are here. Now, if you haven't taken our pre-event survey yet, if you'll take just a moment to do so now, we're dropping the link into the chat thread too. Your honest and anonymous answers will help Village Square with a major nationally scoped research effort to better understand divisions in the United States. Even if you've done the survey for another program, we ask that you complete it again this time. We are delighted to welcome streaming partners, USC Center for the Political Future, National Institute for Civil Discourse, Listen First Project, Common Ground Committee, Bridge USA, Braver Angels, which I know John knows very well, Civic Health Project, McCourtney Institute for Democracy, Unify, Talking Politics, <laughs> Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Now that sounds really interesting. I should know, <laughs> I should know about that, Jeff. Citizen Connect, Center for the Humanities at University of Miami, Network for Responsible Public Policy, and our wonderful long-term local partner, partners, the Tallahassee Democrat and WFSU Public Media. And now it's our deepest honor and privilege to introduce tonight's special guest, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. John is a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at NYU's Stern School of Business. His research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultural and political differences. In addition to his numerous scholarly publication, he's the author of five books, including The Happiness Hypothesis, 
coddling of the American mind and the body of work we've built the village square using all these years, the righteous mind, why good people are divided by politics and religion. He's been named a top 100 global thinker by Foreign Policy Magazine, one of the world's 65 best thinkers of the year by Prospect Magazine, and his four TED Talks have been viewed more than 7 million times. Ladies and gentlemen, my intellectual hero, and I know many of yours, and also really one of my favorite human beings at a human being level, the extraordinary Dr. Jonathan Haidt. John. Oh, well, th wow. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, so I actually, I have a file of like people send me all kinds of things like I have this app that's going to, you know, get people to talk to. I have this I have this web browser that's going to let people be exposed to all sides. And I get so many of these, you know, because everybody wants to do something that will scale. Everyone wants to do something that will, tra you know, transform everything. Um, and I, I can't even respond to them. Anymore. I just put them in a file. Um, but you guys are doing the hard work that actually brings results, which is human beings, American citizens talking to each other, listening to each other. That's really hard work. Um, what I do is easy. I sit in my office and I read books and I and I write things. But you're actually getting red and blue to listen to each other, to learn from each other. So I have tremendous respect for you. Um, and Liz, tremendous affection because you and I have been in this since about 2009 when we first, you reached out to me, we first realized we are completely kindred spirits coming to the same conclusions, me from the academic side, you from the practice side. Uh, so it's great to be here with with you both and with Village Square. And, and that really has kept up all these years. I mean, it, we're so busy, we can't really talk about it very often. But yeah. we consistently find that that your work in moral foundations theory, in some ways, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to figure something out and then you'll write something and we'll go, oh, that's it. So even after Babel, you know, we've found that, that it it's gotten harder and harder and harder. Yeah the worse it's gotten to be able to gather people across differences. And so, you know, your piece that we're going to start with tonight really um, was an aha moment for, for us on that. So, um, so I'll jump right in. So John is also the author, author of the cover, cover piece that I'm referring to after Babel, why the past 10 years of American life have been uniquely stupid, which will start as a jumping off point tonight. And then we'll move to preview his highly anticipated forthcoming book published March 26th, so right around the corner, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. And John, you've said that you've just never seen anything like the interest in this first in this book. Yeah, that's right. Everyone has kids. Every, I'm not everyone. I'm sorry. Most, you know, most people have children and most people see what's happening and they don't know what to make of it. And I didn't know what to make of it. So we'll get to that. Um, so let's talk after Babel. Tell us about your central metaphor in that piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Well, first, though, in the pre-call, you said that you wanted me and Nathan to be like we were talking over a beer. I'm in my NY NYU office. I happen to have a beer in the refrigerator, so I'm I'm cracking open a beer. Uh, Nathan, do you have you have Corey, anything to drink? Corey, how about you? you? <laughs> Corey, yeah, Corey, what, yeah, Corey, you're, well, what are you, you going to do? I, just to, just to, you thought that tea was in here. Well. The, as Frank Sinatra would say, this ain't apple juice. This ain't apple juice, folks. <laughs> all right. Well, okay, so Cheers. I could do this to you, too. I brought all right. I, I all right. Well, so. <laughs> so, We've all um, been drinking off camera. All right. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. It's not your question. Oh, yes, your question was Babel. Your um, central metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in metaphors, I write in metaphors. And as a social psychologist and a professor, I know that people learn from they, you need a kind of a mental structure to be built first, and you can put stuff in it. And um, so much of my work has been in the last 10 years has been on what on earth changed around 2014. Something changed, the universe changed, everything got weird. And this is before Donald Trump came in. This is actually what allowed him to come in, I believe, or made it easier for him. Um, and it, I'd have been sort of tracking this down ever since. And it first showed up on campuses and in a few other places, 2014, 2015. That led me to write the book, The Coddling the American Mind with Greg Lukianoff, the article and then the book later. Um, and I kept learning more about social media. I had a sense that social media had something to do with it. And I kept playing with different metaphors for to explain how an entire system can be transformed so quickly. Um, and we can go to some of the other metaphors later, but the, ba the, the best one I ever found, the one that really you know, just lit it all up and continues to be so productive is the incredible Bible story of the Tower of Babel. It's this short little story. And this story, um, for those who haven't read it in years, 
the the story is about the descendants of Noah, um, and after the flood, they you know they they're repopulating the earth, and they the, his the, the people come to the plain of Shinar, and they decide to build themselves a city with a tower that will reach unto the heavens. Uh, and there's a lot of ambition in this, and they will be like gods. And God, that you know, God will not be able to do this to us again. This flood. Well, God sees what they're doing, and He is offended by their hubris, uh, and He says, uh, you know, look what they begin to do, and now nothing, you know, nothing will be denied to them. And He says, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another. And he doesn't literally destroy the tower. I mean, at least in, in our popular imagining, he knocks it over. But in the Bible, he does something far worse. He just makes it, and no one can understand each other. And when I reread that, and I was working on that, and like every day I was like, what the hell's happening to our country? What is happening? Um, I realized, my God, that's what it is. And if you can put yourself in the place of, of human beings who, you know, just came out of the flood, and now they have this incredible city, like, wouldn't you be incredibly proud? And... And, and this corresponded to the incredible period from the fall of the Berlin Wall through the early internet, through the Arab Spring, where we thought, yay, liberal democracy, we did it, end of history, this is the way. Now it's just a question of fine tuning equality and issues like that. Um, so this incredible optimism up to 20, about 2012, and then everything goes south, everything turns around in the 2010s. And so that's what the metaphor is. And then we can talk about like what caused that to happen. I think the biggest issue is the transition to the network era and social media, but there, there are other causes as well. There, there were some ingredients that you introduced in that article that led to, we could have thought about the democratization of media, if you will, or social <laughs> media at the very least, but there were some things like the like button or the share yeah. button that introduced <laughs> the degradation, if you will. Could you, could you flesh that out a little bit for us? Sure. Um, so the entire history of humanity can be told through the story of increasing connection. And Robert Wright does this brilliantly in, in a book called Non-Zero in 1999. And as we get, you know, roads and then transport and then the telegraph and mail, you know, I mean, it's amazing what happens when you connect people and that's all great. You know, and then we get the telephone. Think about telephone connections. You know, you can call anyone in the world, practically. You could do that by the 1970s or 80s or 90s. So that was all great. And we thought more connection is better. And then the internet comes in and it's, you know, I, I mean, older people here will remember the first time they tried a web browser, the first time they said, you mean I can get all the information in the world within a second? <laughs> like it was godlike. It really was like we were gods. Um, and in fact, a little, just a little, uh, you know, trivia point, um, when writing the Babel article, I learned that the, uh, um, uh, 20, uh, 2011 or 2012 is when, 2011, I think, is when Google Translate uh, was made available to the world. So it was literally the year that we overcame the curse of Babel. Now, anybody could talk to anybody and they could understand each other. And that's basically when everything fell down to. So the reason why uh, uh, is that more connection seems better, but it depends on the nature of the connection. If you just allow people to talk literally one on one, that's fantastic. Um, and then, well, but you know, what about each person can talk to lots of people? Well, that might seem good. That seems like it's good for democracy. It seems like a really healthy public square. But what if, what if it's not really like you know Hyde Park or Speaker's Corner? What if it's more like the Roman Colosseum? What if the company that is creating this public square designed it? on the model of the Roman Colosseum, where people would pay for admission. And what they're there to see is not the kind of conversations that Corey curates. What they're there to see is people getting their heads ripped off by lions and stabbed through the, you know, through the stomach with a sword. Um, that's what they're paying for. That's what they want to see. That's what, that's what they reinforce. Uh, and so if we take any conception of democracy or democratic engagement, and we say, instead of linking people up to talk, let's Put everybody in this weird, scary, you know, Twilight Zone funhouse uh, mirror place um, where whatever you say is echoed and distorted and your perception of reality is completely distorted. Um, and I mean, you, I mean, God, you, you know, you go to Twitter, you look at someone says some simple thing and in the comments, it's just people go. And this is actually a key point that I only learned recently after I wrote the article. I think it was threaded comment. This So, OK, so the like button is is the first thing that really uh, you know, 
um, allows people to give information to the platform so they can now use algorithms. The retweet button, I think, is the key thing because that is what truly makes things viral. And then the share button is Facebook's cup. So every, now everybody has a like button and a, and a share or re retweet button. Everything goes super viral. That's 2009. I thought that was the key turning point, and it, it is. But uh, uh, another really important point is 2013 when Facebook introduces threaded comments. So it's not just like Barack Obama would say something and then some person would say, you know, they, you know, they use some racial epithet or say, you know, you're an idiot. And that was the end of it. Now, after 2013, someone says something and then someone else can jump in and argue with that person. Mm. And now you have infinite, it, you know, it's like, it's like a fractal pattern of, an, of and that's yeah, a fractal pattern of fighting. And if that's what a democracy is, is fighting, fighting, fighting at every level, that's how you get the fragmentation of everything. Um, I don't know if that was my title for this event or your title. It's a very good title. Um, but it was really, it was social media that gave us the possibility of, of you know, almost it was like the end of uh, Brave New World, not Brave New World, at the end of um, uh, 1984. You know, imagine a boot on a human face forever. You know, no, actually what the future is, is imagine people screaming at each other on Twitter forever. <laughs> that's, that's a picture of hell i don't want to i don't want to experience we're, we're kind of there but yeah yeah well well so um you had a quote from mark zuckerberger when he launched P facebook took it public that i had never read before that was just uncanny it's to th that his goal was to rewire the way people spread and consume mm -hmm. information check um, the power to share, it would be great for the, um, to help them once again, transform many of our core institutions and industries check again. So something about that, I mean, it, it rings totally true, but there's something yeah. central to that. That seems like, um, kind of a naive, um, notion of what humans would do when we created the like button and the threaded comments. That's right. And so that brings us, so let, let's bring in really one of the main areas of, of my research is is to understand left and right. And, you know, I've really come to see when I when I was writing The Happiness Hypothesis, my first book, I think I ended with a, a quote from Heraclitus, something about, you know, from the tension of opposites, the harmony of opposites comes, you know, all good things. Um, and I really came to see that, and this is why diversity matters, but especially political diversity, you need to listen to people on the other side because they see things you don't. And I was always on the left and I was, you know, progressive Democrat. And and when I started writing The Righteous Mind, it was actually to try to help the Democrats stop saying stupid things and start appealing to American morality, which, you know, uh, Al Gore and uh, John Kerry had no idea how to do. Um, but what I discovered while writing the book is that I, I, I committed to really understanding conservatives. So I started reading conservative writings, um, you know, Thomas Sowell, and there's an incredible book by historian Jerry Mueller called uh, Conservatism. It's, it's an intellectual history. Um, and from those I learned, I'd never read um, um, Edmund Burke, but from them I learned one of the core conservative insights is that we need structure, stability, and order in society. And and such things are built up slowly over generations. And we often do not understand how they work. We can't just go in and say, oh, that marriage thing, you know, well, that's patriarchal. Let's just, you know, change it. Let's just, let's just abolish it. Um, you, you can't just go in. This is what conservatives recognize and progressives don't. Progressives cannot recognize because the whole idea is the progressives are pulling to knock down old things and build new things. And the conservatives are standing athwart history yelling stop or at least slow down. And so if they're in balance, well, that actually, that's exactly what Heraclitus was saying. But what if in an institution like a university, you get rid of all the conservatives so that all you have are people saying, tear everything down, burn everything down, let's start afresh with a, a, a utopia. Well, that will never work. It's not just that it won't work. It will always lead to horrible, horrible outcomes. Uh, and conversely, a society with only conservatives tends to get pretty repressive and is not going to advance. Um, so anyway, um, wait, what was the question that launched this about... Um, um, just about the, the uh, naivete about human nature. Ah, yes, that's right. So Mark Zuckerberg, you've got, you know, he started Facebook at 23 or whatever, you know, so here he is in his mid or late 20, late 20s, I guess, when he says this, maybe 30 or something. Um, and what he's basically saying is, we're just, we're just going to just rewire everything. All those institutions built up over hundreds of years all over the world. Let's just forget that. Let's just rewire everything. We're going to make them be all better. It's, yeah, it's going to be great. That's right. 
And um, so it was incredibly naive um, and incredibly destructive. And basically, you know, what I said in The Righteous Mind was the blind spot of the left is moral capital. The left has a lot of trouble understanding like ideas from Emile Durkheim and, 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 uh, um, and Burke um, about what it takes to hold together, what it takes to have a cohesive moral society. It's very, very hard to have a large multi-ethnic secular democracy. And I think social media and Facebook in particular um, has, and, and, and then Twitter, of course, has just really, to go back to the Babylon metaphor, it's, sorry, when you drink beer, you have uh, interruptions. But, <laughs> um, to go back to the Babylon metaphor, it's like you put all these stones together, you put some mortar in to hold the tower together, and social media is acid that just eats away all the mortar and then the tower collapses. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the first things I learned from you in a very deep way from your first TED Talk. And actually, um, we've got links for the TED Talks. If you don't know that much about John's work, would highly recommend them. We'll pop them into the chat. Um, that moral communities, while I was trying to build a moral community here in Tallahassee, yeah, Tallahassee. at the Village Square, moral communities are hard to build and easy to destroy. And 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 I, I do think that's the thing that, you know, we've learned a lot about sort of the little platoons that hold things together, yeah. that we're always yeah. sort of trying to get people clumped up. And it does seem to be a consistent blind spot to, you know, great, uh, great damage. Yeah, that's right. What, one of the epiphanies, if you will, that really you articulated so well was the the idea that with social media as it's become to dominate so many of our lives it's less about connecting mm -hmm. and more about performing i couldn't help but think about the uh the famous quote that's attributed to dostoevsky at first art imitates life then life will imitate art then life will find its very existence from the arts it seems that so much of our engagement is exactly that. We're trying to find a, a sense of meaning from how many likes and uh, shares and reactions that we get. Um, I was curious how that, how, in a practical way, how that shows up in your classrooms, because you're now seeing mm -hmm. Gen Z, yeah. even in your, in your grad school classes. Yeah, Do right. you see that in your, in your um, classroom? Um, yes and no. So I teach in a business school where people are very pragmatic. They're here to advance their careers. There's not a lot of political, they're not here to protest. Um, and, and so, whereas I hear from my colleagues in other departments that they have to walk on eggshells because anything they say, students will be taping them, videotaping them. It could go up, it could go up on, you know, right wing, you know, or, you know enrage the right. If it's a lefty professor, it could go up on left wing if, if anyone, you know, so... Um, so that's really what happened in 2015. And I, I, I have seen that all over the academic world. Um, professors are teaching on eggshells. Students are walking on eggshells. Uh, one student said to a friend of mine, she said, my motto is silence is safer. Just mm. don't say anything and you won't get in trouble. And can you imagine being a, that, you know, if that's, you can't have in college. college that's, yeah. Of all places, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm definitely seeing this fear all over and I'm, I'm, I have to be very careful. Um, you know, I have to be careful what I, what I say, although I have learned, you know, especially early on, I was uh, 2015, 26, I was very careful and, but, but now I'm coming to really trust my students more and be very open with them and, and, and the trust is kind of coming back. Um, but, um, but where I really see it with my students is I teach a course on flourishing at, at here at NYU Stern and, um, I work with the students on their morning and evening routines, and I, and I've discovered that they they've gotten themselves they're stuck in a trap in which they have to service hundreds and hundreds of network connections every day, and so the first thing they do when they open their eyes, I work with them on the morning routine. What do you do? Let's set yourself up for a good day. What's the first thing you do when you open your eyes? Do you go to the bathroom? Do you get a drink? No, the first thing everybody just about check your notifications. What came in overnight, uh, and then. What's the last thing you do before you shut your eyes at night? Check your notifications. And what do you do in between? Check your notifications. I mean, they do some other things, but not a lot. So, um, so I do see just the the complete the the sort of the extraction of pretty much all of their attention goes to their phones because that's they've been stuck in this trap. So we'll get to that later with the with the new book. Um, yeah. But but the the move from the move from flip phones. And the early internet, the early internet was fantastic. We all loved it. But the move to the new, much more viral, radical uh, uh, internet, which is all performative, I think that's what you're getting at, Corey, which is much more performative, that's what has devastated human relationships, human institutions, and any possibility of shared stories or shared reality. 
Yeah, just as a follow up, and not to jump ahead too much, but there was uh, an exercise that you assigned to your students, and I forgive me, I forgot the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, I want to say it's walk. the the awe walker. I was oh, going to yeah. say the wonder yeah. walk. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? I'm going to do that. I'm going to leave my earbuds at home when I take my mm -hmm. walk tomorrow because yeah. of that. Yeah. So, so I've, I've taught the course for a long time as a six-week course for MBA students where we just sort of cover some basics of how to have a happier career in business. But because uh, Gen Z has such high rates of depression, in 2018, 2019, uh, you know, we noticed like, wow, our undergrads here at Stern have very high rates of depression, anxiety, like everywhere. It's no, no different. Um, and so I decided to make a much longer, you know, take, take, make a full semester course on, on flourishing. And that allowed me to work in some other things. And so I worked in a section on play, uh, a class on play with a, a wonderful graduate student, Yijin Park, um, and beauty and awe as part of the good life. And so um, I had them listen to this wonderful conversation between my friend Dacher Keltner, um, a professor at UC Berkeley, wrote a book on awe, and Krista Tippett. And Dacher describes uh, uh, how he, what, what he didn't when his his brother died of cancer, and part of his healing was he would go for walks in in, in nature, just walk slowly and just just be, and and you know awe. He lives on you know the California coast. I mean you know awe uh, makes us feel small in a wonderful way. It makes us less petty. It makes us more open. So you know Dacher has shown awe has all these transformative regenerative effects. And so I thought, wow, what a great exercise. And so just, I did it for the first time last, uh, about a year ago with my class last spring. I said, so listen to this podcast episode so you understand what it is. Now go out. And the first time I just said, don't take out your phone. Although the more recently I said, don't even bring your phone. Um, uh, and I said, don't take out your phone, just walk walk slowly. Um, and some of, the, some of the students did this around Greenwich Village, which is, you know, has a lot of beautiful buildings and they really noticed things. But the ones who went to parks, who went to either Washington Square Park or, or Central Park, a lot of them had almost full-blown religious experiences of a feeling, and you know, a feeling of connection came over me. And I looked at all the people with love and I felt, you know, we're all really one. And what do I have to worry? I mean, it was amazing the effect that this had. And, and as we talked about it, I realized, you know, the students, and well, all of us now, I, I'm wearing AirPods now, um, but I wear AirPods a lot because it's incredibly efficient. We're all able to multitask and we multitask all the time. The amount we have to take in is so much more than 24 hours a day that everyone is trying to stuff in as much as they can. What that means is that young people in particular, but may, a lot of us adults, have pretty much zero minutes to appreciate beauty, zero minutes to reflect on anything, zero minutes to process anything. Because you know it's like we're all geese with a giant thing stuffed down our throat, <laughs> like just stuffing us full of, of, of content. And, and a lot of the students enjoyed it so much that they did, as I did, because I took an all walk too, is now at least, you know, I do still do a lot of multitasking, but especially when I walk through Washington Square Park, which is such a beautiful park, you know, I, I almost never listen to anything. I just, I take, you know, I just look, I especially look up at the trees. The trees are so beautiful. Um, and it, so you can work little shots of awe in. And our, our transformation to these technologically wired creatures um, is really blocking our, our ability to access nature. You know, we evolved in nature. We need nature. And we're cut out, cutting ourselves off. Yeah. Yeah. And then contrasting that with what we're moving into, there's another metaphor that you used inside of the piece um, about dart guns that seems mm -hmm. important. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the most remarkable collapse um, that I've ever witnessed was the collapse of uh, a university presidents and, um, um, and then leaders in just about anything when faced with protesters in 2015. You know, the protesters would say, you know, Yale is a white supremacist institution. We have to totally change it. And the president would never say, oh, explain what you mean. Like, uh, you know, I disagree or tell me why. Let's talk. They'd never said that. You know, it was just, you know, it was just like, okay, yeah, you're right. Like, let's, we'll do whatever you say. And this happened in university after university. And I can count on one hand, the number of presidents who ever said, now, wait a second. Um, or the number of presidents or schools that ever punished a student for shouting down speakers. No one ever got punished. Like, why? Why won't you enforce your rules? Why are you letting chaos reign? And that was 2015, 2016 in the university side. Uh, and then by 2017, 2018, as Gen Z, or 1996 and later, as Gen Z began to graduate, go out into the working world, 
um, uh, 2019, we began to see this in all the epistemic institutions, that is all the knowledge creating institutions that hire from the elite Ivy League schools. So you got these terrible ideas about speech as violence, everything has to be, you know, anti-racist, everything has to be uh, ideological. Um, they they pervade journalism, the, uh, museums, you know, you know the arts, um, uh, and so you see the collapse of these institutions, the the betrayal of their mission, and when news when newspapers are saying we're not going to cover the other side because we're not going to give them a platform, like that's the complete corruption of journalism. So what the hell was happening? Uh, it began on campus, and my God, we all saw spectacular evidence of this last, you know, last fall, especially the congressional hearings. These these university presidents. Um, so I was trying to figure, how did this happen? Like, why is everyone just giving in? Why won't anyone say anything? Uh, and what I realized is, you know, we're all intimidated. We're all afraid. Afraid of what? We, most of us have a lot of us have tenure. We can't be fired. What are we afraid of? Well, you know, being being publicly shamed. Is about the most painful thing that can happen. Um, I mean, of course, you could you know you could lose a child. There are other things that are worse. But for most people, if you gave them a choice, would you like your reputation to be ruined and trashed, or would you like to be shot with a dart gun, like an actual dart gun that will shoot metal darts into your body? Um, almost everybody would pick the darts. Certainly, anyone who's been publicly shamed and humiliated would, would pick the darts. Um, and you know, and I realized so. This is what's happening. Um, everyone's afraid of being publicly shamed. Twitter makes it, anyone can shame anyone at any moment. You can destroy anyone's reputation. Just, you know, just make an accusation. You can make it anonymously. It doesn't have to be true. You can destroy anyone. Um, and so I thought the metaphor here, um, you know, it's really like dart guns because uh, I quote this engineer from Twitter who worked on the retweet button. And when they released it, pretty soon they saw Twitter mobs forming. And this engineer said, it was like we just gave a, a loaded gun to a four-year-old. That's what, the retweet button did. And I thought that was right. But I said, it's not really a gun, it's a dart gun. Uh, and so, yeah, so that was the metaphor. And I think that's been very helpful because this is because the, who gets darted? It, it, people aren't really darting their enemies. Like people on the left can't really like harm people on the, on the far right. So who do they shoot? They shoot anybody in a position of leadership and they shoot the moderates. And of course that happens on the, on the right too. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the Republican party has eliminated all its moderates. And so very germane to all of our interest here, if you've got the middle, it's 70 or 80% of the country, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, but you've got the right wing, the far right and the far left, you know, in the hidden tribe study, you know, the, the devoted conservatives and the, the uh, progressive activists. If, if you hype, if you super empower them, if you say everyone can have a dart gun, it's free and you get paid by the dart, the more you shoot, the more points you get. Most of us say, I don't want to shoot anyone. I'm not going to shoot anyone. But the far right and the far left say, oh boy, let, let me have it. And they shoot, shoot, shoot. And so that's why everything went to hell around 2014. It wasn't like this in 2012. Yeah, so really quickly, you've changed the whole society really quickly by virtue of this dynamic that silences in-group moderates yep. that sort yep. of help you inside the group, helps um, make the group understand things that maybe they don't really. Um, and then also um, authority figures because they're so afraid mm -hmm. of this dynamic. Right, right, right. And then once the authority figures um, betray their trust, now you have people, especially on the right, they look at these, because most of these are left-leaning, the, the institutions. So people on the right look at this and they say, well, th you know, they're not doing their job. They don't, they're, they're dishonest and they're just part of the blue team. They're just, they're just agents of the blue team. Why should we trust the health authorities? Why should we trust the universities? And they're not right. wrong. So one of the things that you touched upon um, that I, I'd like to dive into, I, I know Liz wants to ask you about possible reforms, which you covered in that article. But one thing I was really curious about, a, a concept I've heard at a scholar that I know um, that you've uh, quoted from uh, Renee De Darista. Oh, she's she speaks great, yeah. About, yeah. Um, I, I heard it last night, actually, on a, um, a call about the after party that David French and Dr. Moore and uh, Curtis Chang are developing specifically for churches. The concept is bespoke realities. Um, and hmm. the, the, the noise, the volume of the extremes, that 6% on the extreme right or the 8% on the extreme left might give those of us in the exhausted majority an aversion to wanting to hear from the other side. But as you say, uh, John, I know John Stuart Mill is a is a big <laughs> is yeah. a big figure for you. Friend of mine, yeah. 
<laughs> it feels that way when you really study someone that deeply yeah. um but you quoted he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that so my question is do you have rec what, what recommendations do you have mm -hmm. to seeking out and understanding yeah. a, 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 the best versions of the other side of the case mm -hmm. if you will yeah no thank you for that um you know so yeah first uh, you know, going back to the idea of the tension of opposites and how much I learned when I actually tried to listen to conservatives, um, I feel I became a much better social scientist once I really sought out multiple perspectives. And of course, that's why we say we want diversity is because it has those benefits. John Stuart Mill on Liberty, chapter two is the greatest text ever written um, on why we need diversity of thought, why how it makes us smarter. Uh, in fact, my course, my flourishing course is based on three three principles. I tell the students, we're going to work together to make you stronger emotionally, smarter, and more sociable. And if we can do those three things, then you're going to be more successful in work and in love relationships. And that's what Freud said is, you know, health, love and work. Um, and to get smarter, I tell them, okay, we're going to raise your IQ by 15 points today. Like I can't literally change what, what um, you know, what score you get in IQ test, but I can make you act as though you were 15 IQ points higher. And there's two parts to it. The first part is turn off all of your notifications except for five apps. You can only leave on five apps. We have to cut your notifications by 90%. Stop interrupting yourself every two minutes. Uh, so we work a lot on getting control of their inputs. That's half of it. But the other half is I have them read a, a, a short section at Heterodox Academy. We created a version of Mills on Liberty. It's called All Minus One. If you just Google All Minus One, you get this really beautifully illustrated, condensed version of Chapter Two of On Liberty. Um, so I have students read read part of that, um, and uh, oh, and I have them watch the incredible TED Talk, the work of Daryl Davis, a hero of all of ours, you know, black man who befriended members of the Klan and listen to them. He that's his secret. He says, listen to them. And then they'll listen to you. Um, and so, so I show my students how, um, how if you actually want to get smarter, don't go fighting your enemies, go listening to them. And there's this amazing thing where if you want to get smarter, just ask the world to do it for you and they'll do it. Put your ideas out there, get people to critique them. You'll find out where you're wrong. You'll actually get smarter. So, you know, this is just what I've learned both as, as an academic and as a person studying moral psychology and as a centrist. Um, is, you know, the, the media environment is, is pushing us into, I'm not sure what Renee meant by bespoke realities, but I can imagine. I know she has a, a, a new book coming out, which I'm going to read in the next few days. She sent me a, a, a manuscript to, to evaluate, you know, to possibly endorse. I love her work. Um, I'm imagining bespoke realities are, would refer to the fact that like people can so quickly create a reality on social media and then they can live in it. Is that, is that what it is? Do you know what the concept is? Okay. It is. It's also curating what media you're digesting, what, mm. um, you know, what p other people you're speaking with, uh, getting into, um, bespoke realities, bespoke, uh, groups of people who are only yeah. underscoring your beliefs. Right. You know, right. and, and it's what Todd Rose also talks about in Collective Illusions. If we only hang out with a bunch of people who agree with us, yeah. all of a sudden our own beliefs become that much uh, more heightened yeah. or or extreme. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. So, so let me let me um, correct uh, sort of a misunderstanding that's out there, at least in the academic world. Um, we've all heard of filter bubbles. The, this idea, you know, people you, you end up with just stuff coming in, and you just believe that. Um, well, political scientists are extremely good at debunking common wisdom or common sense, and sometimes they're right, um, and sometimes they're wrong. And in this case, many of them seem to believe that the filter bubble idea has been debunked, because if you actually look at people on social media, what's coming in? Do they, you know, if you're on the left, do you ever see stuff from the right? Well, actually, you do. And so they say, see, it's debunked. Filter bubbles are fake. There's no such thing. Social media actually exposes you to more different views. And that's true but here's why it's irrelevant and wrong. If you define filter bubbles, not as what news sources are coming at you, but who are you connected to as these news sources come in, hmm. then there's very strong evidence of, of these tight ideological communities. So if you're in a left-wing community or a right, let's say left-wing community and everyone, you, know, you, you come together to rag on how stupid and evil the right is, so someone shows you something from Fox News, yeah, you see something from Fox News, but you're all there together to spit on it. That doesn't open you up. That just solidifies the tribal identities. So if you ever hear a political scientist tell you, ah, oh, filter bubbles are debunked, 
tell them that's only informational filter bubbles. If you if you're a social psychologist, you're more interested in the groups. And boy, does social media create tight groups that reinforce prejudices. That makes so much sense. I have one buddy in particular who uh, is a strong supporter of. Uh, well, let's just say we're on we're not on the same. Uh, ideological side. He says, oh, no, no, no. I forced myself to watch just enough MSNBC. And I'm neither MSNBC or Fox. Mm -hmm. I try to, you know, but I, what I learned was he's only getting MSNBC through clips that Ben Shapiro plays. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. dude. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. I think there's a phrase, uh, was it hate, hate follow or hate watch? Like, <laughs> You know, I follow someone just because I hate them so much and I enjoy hating on them. Right, right. You know, and yeah, so that's, yeah. Um, so I want to slip a question in from the audience, a question from the one and only Steve Seibert, another of my favorite. Oh, Steve, my God. Universe. Hello, Steve. Um, importantly, Steve is the co-founder of the Asteroids Club with yes. John. The two of them got in a car and five hours later uh, came out of the car with a big job for me to do. Which was, That's right. We set up a uh, website, the Asteroids Club. That's yeah, right. which we ha we've had a lot of fun about, and it's actually still up there. But anyway, so Steve's question is, acknowledging that a free and diverse people host a broad and often conflicting range of moral foundations, how do we find enough common ground to operate a democracy and still stay true to our own principles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I don't, you know, the, the whole idea of our founding, well, the whole, there are many ideas. One of the ideas of the founding fathers is it's a large, diverse country. Um, and um, we're going to let the states really, you know, run a lot of their affairs. And we're going to try to have things as local as possible, not like the French model of a central authority. And uh, so it's not, it's not clear to me that we need a lot of common ground, like common moral values necessarily. Uh, it's, it, but what we do need, we certainly need, uh, absolutely, we need a sense of commitment to the rules and playing by the rules and having a procedure for generating rules. That's for sure. Um, although I'm coming around more and more to the view that um, that the the challenge that we're the challenge that we've been facing for a long time, or it's going to be much more intense over the next fifty hundred years, is, is 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 how do you hold a society together? And you know, I, I write about evolution in all of my books. I always write a lot about evolution. It's miraculous how humans evolved to be these ultra social creatures. And the the tricks that we have to bind us together, one of the main ones is sacredness, is religion. The psychology of religion evolved, I believe, by a process of, of multi-level selection, including group selection, where groups that could cohere by circling around a sacred object or book or person, they trust each other, they have a higher purpose, uh, they, they, they enforce morality on themselves, they can cooperate, they generate wealth. So... Um, if we evolve to be religious, and if religion is the psych it gives us the psychology that binds us together, now you can understand why patriotism is so important, why the flag is treated like a religious object. Um, the flag is not just a piece of cloth. When I was you know, younger and more on the left, I thought it's just a piece of cloth. But now that I've studied moral foundations and sacredness around the world, I, I realize you know, it's a complete miracle that we're all together here, you know, that we're from different you know, ethnic backgrounds and religions. We're in different states, uh, but we all have a sense of being American, and that's going away. Um, young people, um, there's shocking research showing that when I mean, you ask the question, do you think the founding fathers are more heroes or villains? Something like that. Um, Gen Z, a slight majority, I think it is, says villains. The founding fathers are villains, whereas older generations say they're heroes. Now, of course, they had their flaws like all people. And while we wouldn't judge other cultures by our standard, boy, are people happy to judge yesterday by today's standards. So I think that we are kind of rotting out a lot of what would normally hold us together. And for such a large, diverse, secular nation, um, we're right back to the Babel problem. What holds societies together, as I said in the article, traditionally is shared blood, shared gods, and shared enemies. That's how states are formed. Um, and a cohesive state is powerful. It, 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 you know, it can it can expand. Um, and in America, we don't really have the option of shared blood. That actually was a good thing because that made us have shared ideals. That was what bound us together: the American idea. George Washington said it that way. Teddy Roosevelt said it that way. You know, anyone is welcome if they said so just 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 a few ideals that we that we have to, in common. Um, so um, so we do need 
some some it holds certain things sacred together. We do need some degree of shared reality. Not about everything. We can have all kinds of different views in red states and blue states. But you know, um, does the Constitution allow certain things to happen? Yes or no? Well, okay, those are complicated questions. We have the Supreme Court, but you know, but um, in the last few years, we've seen such shocking departures of reality. You know, we can point fingers at both sides. Uh, I, I, maybe I shouldn't do it on this call, but just you know, for example, I mean. You know, it certainly seems to me as though the president tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power. This is just unbelievable. And the fact that we don't all agree that this was shocking is unbelievable to me. And on the left, you know, we have people who are a strong contingent that denies that biological sex is a reality. And we should therefore change a lot of our policies. And to the rest of us, like, wait, you know, we're really um, we're really tolerant about whether people want to you know, live as a different sex, but to say that there's no biology, like this is just bizarre. And so, you know, so both sides, you have this process of just flying away from reality towards extreme beliefs. And here the psychology of religion is so interesting. Um, believing something impossible is a much better test of whether you are a member than believing something that makes sense. And so the far right and the far left as, as quasi-religions make a lot more sense once you see that, of course, they believe crazy stuff. That's what binds them together. Yeah, I think uh, doing this work for a long time, one of my, you know, thoughts is often something like, you know, big unexpected events can cause people to come together, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. and then over the years, it's been one thing after the other that you've kind of gone, well, that's going to bring us together. Yeah. Um, and then it does exactly the opposite. So, Asking this question in a very unserious way first, and then in a serious one, <laughs> would a Martian invasion do the trick, do you think? That's A. And then B, um, you uh, you close your piece in the Atlantic um, talking about three you know general ideas of what we can do. Yeah. So, right. So your, what your question is, uh, is directed at is the, the social psychological principle or the Bedouin um, proverb, or not proverb, but saying me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. So humans do this tribal recursive thing, whatever the relevant level is. And this is every buddy movie that was ever made in a military, you know, about a war movie, you know, they're, they're, they're people are all against, you know, the tensions, but then they come together to defeat, you know, or sports movies, whatever it is. I was just thinking of the, the Bugs Bunny Daffy Duck with Elmer Fudd. Shoot him now, shoot him now. <laughs> That's, and that uh, yeah. Bugs and Daffy Duck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're not not very tribal. Um, <laughs> um, so, so in theory, a Martian va invasion would do it, and I think a Martian, an actual Martian invasion, I think that actually would bring us together. But I, there's nothing really short of that that would do it. So, nine eleven really did it, uh, but I think that was the last time, and we might never have that again. Um, uh, you know, I I, th I think I you know I said in some British interview when, for the call in tw 2018, I said something. You know, like if something like 9-11 happened again, I don't think America would come together. And then COVID happened and we did come together for a few weeks and then boom, we were like more wow. divided than ever. Um, so, you know, and then now it's, you know, even if there was a war with Russia, I don't think that would bring us together. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think we're, we're coming apart. And again, the fragmentation of everything, I think we're in big trouble as a country. Um, we need really good sociologists, um, I don't know any sociologists who are part of the conversation today. As far as I can tell, they're all off protesting Israel. They're they're sort of asleep at their posts. Like they, they need to be telling us, like, what does it take to have a decent society? And they're just not there. Yeah. No, I go ahead. Sorry, Liz. Oh, so your recommendations. I wanted to make sure that we move oh, on yes. to your upcoming yeah. book. Yeah. So recommendations. Um so certainly, so procedural fairness is essential. Even if you disagree on facts, if you at least agree that the process by which laws are decided is legit, then the research by Tom Tyler at Yale shows that people are actually very willing to accept adverse decisions. Um, and so we have to improve um, the institutions of our democracy. That includes elections, especially, how they're certified, how they're run. Um, you know, so there's a lot we need to do there. And, you know, I think, you know, voter ID is, is a very good idea. It probably doesn't reduce much fraud, but it would rise confidence and everyone has an ID. It's just a red herring to think that this is discriminatory. Um, 
So um, that's one idea from from the right. Um, but but also making it easy for people to vote is you know that's an idea from the left. So I think we need to reform our democratic institutions to withstand this insane period that we're going through. Um, and at, at present, as I understand it, the political parties kind of make the rules, like whichever party governs an area, they get to make the rules. That's crazy. That's terrible. We need nonpartisan rulemaking so that we have more trust in elections. That's just an example of one of the things we can do to reform elections. I think all of us on this call probably agree that primaries, that, that closed party primaries are one of the main avenues by which extremists get into Congress. So I think that those are terrible. So there's a lot of things like that. That's one bucket. Um, second bucket of reforms is to reform social media. Because as long as social media is the way it is, I think we're headed towards failure. I think we're headed towards um, constitutional disruptions and a, a break in the tradition that we've had since the 18th century. Um, now that's very hard to do. And I have some ideas, but I'm not confident that they'll work. Um, uh, there are many great, uh, Rene Duresta has lots of great ideas. Um, uh, Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower had really good ideas about uh, how do you have reforms that are viewpoint neutral? We're not like saying you can't say X, Y, or Z. What she's saying is the design, the platform is designed so that extremists can get this super duper boost. How about just dampening that? Just dampening it. Just limit. You can only invite you know a hundred people a, a day or a week to to a group, as opposed to the fringes who invite thousands. Um, so there are architectural reforms that would make it less crazy viral less likely to differentially spread bad information rather than good. Uh, so reforming social media, um, some sort of user authentication, I think would be incredibly helpful. It's complicated or difficult to have that be a legal or federal mandate. But if platforms and LinkedIn, I think is working on this. Um, LinkedIn, I think is pairing with clear to have verified identity. You know, we go to airports, we have to show who we are. Uh, wouldn't it be great if there were social platforms where you actually knew that people were real and you don't even have to know their names necessarily, but just that they were authenticated. Anyway, so social media reforms. And then the third bucket of reforms um, is we absolutely have to right away, starting today, um, change what's happening to young people because we have so interfered with human development um, that it is crippling a generation. Um, and... Okay, so so let's so yeah, so let's go. Okay, let's go there. Let's, we, let's talk about the new book because that's really what the whole, yeah, the whole yeah. book is about. Yeah. So, um, so if anyone has read uh, my book with Greg Lukianoff, the Coddling of the American Mind, you know, we talked about we had a whole chapter on overprotection of children and children need to play. We you know we said a lot of that there, and we speculated that maybe social media is also part of this, but in 2017 we weren't sure. Um, well, I've done a lot of research since then, and now I'm very confident. Um, what we saw, ha what, what happened in the United States um, is that mental health of teenagers was actually pretty stable from the 90s through about 2010, 2011. And then by 2013, it falls off a cliff, um, especially for girls. Every measure of anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide, um, they all go shooting up in a, like a hockey stick pattern around 2012, 2013. And they keep going up. They're still going up today. And many people think it's COVID. It's not COVID. You look at the graphs. Yeah, COVID accelerated a little bit and then it came back, but it's just where it was if there was, COVID was a blip. COVID, it, it seemed like a big deal, but it's nothing compared to whatever happened in the early 2010s. So my book is about that, what the hell happened? And um, I can say it very concisely, what happened is that uh, humans have always had a play-based childhood because like all mammals, our kids play. Kids are very playful. Puppies are playful, kitties are playful. They have to play. And we kind of gradually stopped that in the 90s and early 2000s because we thought they'll be abducted if they're ever outside. We can't let them outside. We can't let them outside. So we took away the play-based childhood gradually. And then all of a sudden, around 2010, 2011, we gave them a phone-based childhood. Uh, and so the key moment is when, when a millennial middle school kid, let's say a girl, traded in her flip phone, which is not, flip phones are fine. Flip phones, you communicate with one or two people. Um, when she traded her flip phone for a smartphone with Instagram and a high-speed data connection. So she could spend three or four hours a day on it. She became the first member of Gen Z. Um, and once, because all the, most of the girls got on around 2013 when Facebook buys Instagram, that's when it becomes super popular. It's not just Instagram. I mean, it's the whole phone-based childhood. In 2010, very few teenagers had a smartphone. They were still on flip phones. In 2015, they almost all did. And they were on many hours a day. 
So I'm calling that period, 2010 to 2015, the great rewiring of childhood. We used to have a childhood before the 80s. We had a childhood where kids would be out, they'd play, they would get into trouble, they would get lost, they'd find their way back. That's how you learn to become a self-governing person. You work, you work together to solve problems. Um, but by 2010, we'd stop that. We don't let them become self-governing. And instead, we said, here's a phone. And you know, any, as soon as you give your kid a phone, it's an experience blocker. It's going to basically be in front of their face most of the day. And they're not going to have many other experiences. Almost everything comes through the phone. All dating now goes through the phone. Um, so I think that's what happened. And that's why mental health fell off a cliff. And if the American experiment is an experiment in self-governance, and we somehow worked ourselves into the situation where we do not let our kids practice self-governance. You cannot have any practice becoming self-governance because what if you get into a fight? What if someone gets hurt? We have to have an adult there to supervise, settle disputes, and then we'll send you off to college. And then we college professors like, what is going on? Why can't these kids take it if someone reads a Shakespeare book? Like what is wrong with words now that people are so fragile? So um, yeah, so the new book, The Anxious Generation actually really does connect back to our common interest in democracy. I was fascinated by the chapter Spiritual Elevation and Degradation, which had tip to Liz for reminding me the title of the chapter. I was so engrossed in the chapter, I forgot the title of it. Um, one of the reasons though, and, and I wanna back up for a second, one of the reasons though is because you uh, identify as an atheist. Mm -hmm. So I wanna back up and I, I have a question about your personal background. Sure. I'm trying to picture you growing up uh, around that table with your two sisters and your parents who you re clearly revere. Um, mm -hmm. Did you, at what point were you clear, did you become uh, clear on, or at least start to wonder whether there was a God or not and started to lean towards, no, I'm, I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. And if that was early enough, I'm curious how that conversation around the height dinner table went. Yeah. Did you get pushback from your sisters? Did, you, did Harold have an objection to it? How did that go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I, you know, I'm, I was always like a science kid. I just, I, um, you know, I, I, you know, think analytically. I, I think about systems. I'm abstract. Um, so for me, I, I know that I was not an atheist at my bar mitzvah. Uh, when you know, when I was 13, I didn't. I know I didn't have any issues. I didn't think about you know, does God exist? Or at least I. But I know that by 14 or 15, I was having arguments with my best friend Krister, whose father was a minister, a reverend, Episcopalian, um, and. Uh, so I know that by then I was just saying, well, just, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem likely. What do you think is more likely, you know, this or that? Uh, and then as I learned about evolution that, and then I, I read the the Hebrew Bible when I was in college, read the whole thing. And I was shocked at a lot of the content. And if you take the Bible literally, and you're, you know, you're a sort of modern secular person, there's sure there's plenty of beautiful parts, but man, there's a lot of really, really bad stuff in there. If you Again, if you take it literally. So all of that cemented in me a kind of a hostility to religion. Um, and I was in a way destined to become a new atheist. You know, so I was growing up, we're talking like the 80s and 90s here, but in the early 2000s, you get, you know, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens writing these really, you know, really you know, attack books about religion. Um, and I was the sort of person who could well have become one of those. But because, because I was studying the evolution of morality. And I came to appreciate that religion is centrally tied to that. And I came to see, don't take it literally. And the key was Emil Durkheim, the sociologist Emil Durkheim. Durkheim said the, the, the key to religion is not the beliefs, like, do you believe in an afterlife? The key is that the beliefs and the behaviors all combine to create a community. It's about creating a uh, E pluribus unum. That's basically what it is. It's, it's magic. There's, there's alchemy you can do. You can take a bunch of people and you can put them together and create one. And that is almost a transubstantiation. That is transubstantiation, right? Is that, am I using the word correctly? Uh, I mean, you know, so, um, so once I came to appreciate that religion performs this miracle that makes modern liberal democracies possible, I had a lot more respect for it because I don't take it literally. I, I, I see what it does. I see it, it, that it's part of our nature. We really see that dynamic on the ground all the time when people come together in these really unique ways and you see what happens. And it's it's actually really frustrating because you think, well, we know what to do. We're just not doing it, um, you know. Uh, so you start the anxious generation with another um, really amazing John Hype metaphor. Uh, 
You want to say something about that? I think, you know, if you looked at all the questions, we had like a hundred questions. Um, <laughs> and and when you look at all the questions, there are so many that refer to the 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 rider and the elephant mm -hmm. um, after Babel. So I predict this is going to be another metaphor that enters our common parlance. Oh, OK. All right. So, again, I was casting around for, you know, what happened to our kids? Why is it that kids born in 1997 are so messed up compared to kids born in 1993. Like, how did it happen? I mean, the mental illness rates are unbelievably different, just a few years apart. Um, and you know, and and you know, the key is, I think, especially early puberty, middle school. They had a very different experience uh, from their older siblings. So I was looking for a metaphor for that. Like, what would be such a radical change away from a human environment? You know, a human childhood. What would be so radically inhuman childhood? And and I thought of the metaphor. That you know, suppose um, uh, suppose that you know a tech billionaire had the idea of you know there's a race to Mars. Like these guys are competing to get to Mars, and what if one of them had the idea, hey, let's let's bring kids to Mars uh, because let's let them go through puberty on Mars, lower gravity, different conditions, let their bodies adapt to Mars, and so he starts uh, signing up kids. They don't need any parental permission. You just, you know, they have to say that they have to say that they have parental permission. So you just have to check a box. Yeah, my 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 parents are fine. Yeah. Um, so we start sending kids to Mars. And we're all like, what the hell? What are you doing? Um and um and it turns out that he never ever even thought about children's safety, which wasn't even a concern. Um, there are no protections for children, they're treated like adults. Um, and we have no idea if the changes are going to be permanent. That is. If your kid goes through puberty on Mars, low gravity, high radiation, um, are they going to ever be able to return to Earth or are they permanently changed? Like we would never, ever let a company take our children away without our knowledge or permission and raise them in danger. Like that could never happen. And if a company tried that, we'd sue the hell out of them. Well, guess what? It's happening. And because of Section 230, it seems we can't do anything about it. Um, and so and the reason why this metaphor works, I think, is because in my conversations with parents, um, first, they feel helpless. They feel powerless. They feel, you know, like the main fight all across the developed world is over technology and, and don't spend all day on your phone. And um, so we're all we're all struggling um, with this. Um, and this was brought to us by companies that are basically exploiting our children for their profit. Um, the evidence is mounting that they're harming them actually quite severely. And even though most kids are not mentally ill, it's maybe about a third, which is unbelievable. About a third of kids, I'd say, have an anxiety disorder, depression, something else. You know, about a third of kids are being really messed up by this technology. Now, normally, if it's one in a thousand kids are severely damaged by a consumer product, we would sue the hell out of them and shut them down. But if it's one in three, we don't do anything. Um, um, and let's see, there's one other element that I that I wanted to get to here. Oh, yes, that when I hear stories about the kids who really get addicted over and over again, parents and the kids use the metaphor of being taken away. Like my kid, my beautiful, funny kid, who she was so happy, she's gone. Like, where did, where did she go? And then like, they'll say, we sent her to summer camp for three weeks with no phones. And when she came back, my child was back. I had my child back. She was funny. She was happy. And then she got back on her phone and she went away again. So this metaphor of being taken away to an alien place, which is a horrible place, no child should grow up there. That's where we are. And I should, and, and I need to mention, I tried to mention it yet. I, we've been talking about America. You can have whatever theories you want about what happened in America in 2012. Maybe it wasn't Facebook and Instagram, but the exact same thing happened at the exact same time in the exact same way in Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and the Scandinavian countries. So in countries with a lot of individualism and and uh, uh, what we find is that the kids get washed away. Just so, so incredibly sad and, tr and yeah. tragic. Um, yeah. So um, so you, you mentioned section 230 and we had an audience question about what your perspective on that is. Mm -hmm. So before the, so there were those Senate hearings a week or two ago where we saw the tech executives, Mark Zuckerberg in particular, basically dodging and weaving and, you know, questions, you know, but aren't kids being, you know, sexually propositioned and CSAM material and bullying and drugs and they, oh yes, but, you know, we're going to cut down on that. You know, we have the world's best, you know, we can probably reduce it by, you know, 50% or whatever. Um, 
So before those hearings, I thought, you know, I do, I totally understand the need for Section 230. And for listeners who don't know, it just, it was put up in, in I think 1996, I think it was. Um, it was a section of the Communications Decency Act that said, you know, if you're AOL, you're running a bulletin board and people post something, like you, the company can't be responsible for everything that everyone posts because they can't possibly edit it all. And so without that, there couldn't have been the internet. I understand the principle. And so until recently, I thought if they would just interpret Section 230 properly, um, narrowly, just so that you can't literally sue them because someone else posted something, then that would be, that that actually could make sense. Unfortunately, what's happened, I think some lower court decisions have interpreted it as broadly as possible, meaning um, you can't sue a social media company, you can't make, you can't regulate them because anything you do might interfere with someone's ability to talk on it. Uh, basically, it's been interpreted as a blanket liability shield, I'm sorry, to be clear, the, um, a blanket liability shield. And this is what Francis Haugen and many others have really pointed out. Like, even if you agree with the principle, and I, I do see the principle, um, how can the company not be liable for the architectural decision that they made to make a product more addictive to children and then market that product to children? And they all go for the underage kids. They say 13, but they don't enforce it. None of them enforce it. Um, so these are, you know, if any other industry, like if alcohol or gambling, if they were out recruiting kids on playgrounds and damaging them, we'd sue the hell out of them. Uh, there's only one other industry that has that protection. That's the gun industry. There's special laws for the gun industry. You can't sue a gun manufacturer because someone used their gun to kill your child. Um, and it's the same with social media. You can't sue social media uh, because it's addicted the entire world and is killing children. So yeah, I think Section 2 that needs to go. I now think as a result of those hearings, it needs to just go and be replaced by a new law that's very narrowly tailored to do what the original law was supposed to do. So um, this is a, an apt question, and, and I'm glad I'm drinking just uh, for, because <laughs> this okay. could be very depressing. Uh, but one of our, our participants asked very simply, what gives you hope? Um, let's see. I have to be very careful how I answer this. Um, um, so I'll, I'll just say, you know, I, you know, I, I think that we are in a time where the amount of chaos and fragmentation is going to increase possibly by a lot. So I don't have much hope for the short to medium term, actually. Uh, but what does give me some sanity and, and some inspiration is to see that we're at a juncture point in history, uh, unlike, unlike any other. Um, and to see it that, you know, there are cycles of history, institutions decay, and then they get reborn about every 80 years. And we're at one of those that was predicted long ago in the, 2020, 2025. That's basically where things are supposed to break and then come back together. And then we're at the end of a 500 year period, which we can call the Gutenberg era based on text. We're transitioning to network and our institutions that were made for the Gutenberg era in America constitutions, text, journalism, all that stuff, that may not be translatable to the network here. It might not work. So I think there, there are real possibilities of, of extraordinary things happening beyond what we can really imagine. That is frightening. And I am frightened about that, I must say. On the other hand, what gives me at least some inspiration um, is, that the, is that the things that we do today, the things that we who are not on the extremes, the things that we who care about America, um, who who think that America's done amazing things and is a pro very much like Barack Obama. I mean, it's a process, we're getting better, we're making progress. Um, those of us in the exhausted majority, the things that we do really, really matter. And they didn't matter as much when I was growing up, you know, in the 70s and 80s. It just, it just, it, you know, it didn't matter that much what we did. And now it really, really does. And so um, so I think we have a call to action. You know, there was a greatest generation that was called up to fight fascism. And I think our challenge is different. And it's much harder, but like the work that you're doing, I mean, the work like this is, you know, I, again, I'm an atheist, but I'll say this is God's work. Like, and actually from a Dirk Heimian perspective, it literally is God's work because he said God is society. Um, so, so I am, you know, I'm not depressed. Uh, I'm not, um, you know, I don't think the world is going to end. Um, I think, our, our democracy might become much more like those in Latin America that have been very unstable and that have had changes of constitution, changes of government, military involvement. You know, we, we could have things like that, but we're going to have 
much better economies and Amazon's going to deliver stuff to our houses. So it's going to be better than it was in, in other cases. Um, but I, um, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's it. I mean, let's, we have to, we have to be realistic, I think, in recognizing that enormous change is possible. On the other hand, we have to be humble because as been shown over and over again, especially by Phil Tetlock at Penn, no one can predict the future, get a bunch of experts like me making prognostications. It's really no better than monkeys throwing darts at a wall. Mm. So everyone should take what I say with an enormous grain of salt. I'm describing some cycles. I'm describing what's happening now, but you know, anything could happen tomorrow that changes things. So yeah, you know, don't get, don't get too alarmed. Take what I'm saying as a possibility. But don't go selling your house and moving to New Zealand. <laughs> I am fascinated. <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead, Liz. Yeah, go ahead, Corey. I'm fascinated and have such an affinity for the fact that you're an atheist, and but you have such warmth, if I can say that, for uh, religious folks and even for the idea of religion and value of religion. I really appreciate that there's a, a poetry in that uh, dichotomy. Um, and uh, th that's a whole other podcast, if not a whole other series. But I would like to shoehorn, a, I know we're going to get to uh, some more um, questions, questions of participants. Yes. We have plenty of them. I want to get to uh, a self-serving <laughs> question. Okay. It's what, what, what uh, we refer to as the TPNR question. And we've already been talking about this, but I'd really like to put a, 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 a pin on it. It's what do you think each of us can do to be better able mm. to share space with, have better conversations with, perhaps even nurture relationships with people mm. across our differences? So it's like what we've been talking about. People who think differently than we do, have different beliefs than we do, get their news yeah. from different sources than we do. How do we do yeah. better at this? Talking politics, religion, yeah. without killing each other. <laughs> Shameless <Okay>. plug. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. No, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I would say the key, the key psychological flip is to flip from defend mode to discover mode. Mm. So we can be in one of two states. Our brains are structured, mammal, animal, animal brains are structured so that uh, when there's something good, they get into approach mode and then the, you have approach motivations and it feels good as you're approaching and you're consuming. But if there's a threat, boom, instantly uh, defend mode kicks in within a second, uh, totally changes everything up there, sends hormones out to the body. Um, and so, um, you know, social media has really put us much more, we encounter each other much more in defend mode or attack mode, not in discover mode. Whereas the early internet, you know, when you first got your web browser, wow, that was curious, that was discover mode. That was an incredible gift to humanity, it seemed. So, so if we can recapture, so each, we each individually, if you, so, so here's another way to put it. What game do you want to play? We can play the attack game where I try to get points from my team. Um, we can play the I'm right game where I try to feel good because I'm right and I show you that you're wrong. Um, or we can play the persuasion game where I'm going to try to change your mind while sticking to my beliefs. Um, or you can play the learning game where my goal is actually to learn as much as I can about how the world works. Um, because acting on the world when you don't understand it actually makes things worse. A lot of activism really backfires. And I think there's a huge problem for the left these days. And this is part of the reason why the right is ascendant in many parts of the world. Um, so, um, so flipping into discover mode is the essential first step. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, I was very lucky. I mean, I got to do it because, because I was trying to write a book on politics, on, on left and right. So I literally, it was like, my job was to be in discover mode about the other side. And it's, and I loved it. Like, it was so interesting. It was like getting into cold pool. You know, at first it was like, you know, icky and painful, but like, then it was like, oh, actually, wow. Once you're in it, like, this is really interesting. Um, so I, I sort of got there by an academic route. Um, a lot of people get there through religious roots or religious conversion experiences or um, all experiences because what those always do, like someone doesn't come back from one of these powerful religious experience saying, you know, now I want to make as much money as I can and I want to defeat my enemies. Like, no, it's so it's never that. It's more like you become less petty, more open-hearted, more open-minded, more loving. So uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. And then a lot of people come to it from having a carefully curated or accidental experience of encountering the humanity of someone else. And that's what you guys are in the business of doing. That's what the village square really has pioneered and really has developed so well. Um, you know, and you have, you know, have all this like secret sauce, you have all these like, you know, tr not tricks, but you know, techniques you do, if you're going to bring people together, food is really important. Um, I want long ago, I suggest that we try to do experiments like, 
let's try experimentally with alcohol. Like if you encourage people to drink versus don't, you know, <laughs> what happens? I mean, I, you know, maybe it should do with psychedelics, you, you know? Yeah. If you, if you sing a song at the beginning yes. or say the Pledge of Allegiance, what happens? That's right. That's right. So, um, so, you know, this is what people say universally is, you know, when you encounter someone on the other side in the right way, you discover that, you know, they love their children, they have their, you know, hardworking, you know, you discover that they have many virtues. Um, so there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways to do it. But the key is you have to get out of the game, you know, the game of, of attack or the game of gaining points. And, and, and again, social media makes us get into that prestige hungry game. So, I guess the first step, as I tell my students, is regain control of your inputs. Uh, either cut out social media entirely, or you know, it's useful for some things. You know, spend an hour or two a weekend on it. But you know, if you're spending an hour or two a day, that's a huge amount of your life, and it's making you worse. It's making you a worse person. Somewhere, Monty <laughs> Guzman is smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I love her. We're work. all yeah. fans of Monty's. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so, in the anxious generation, you write about the collective impact problem, uh, or excuse me. Um, the collective Active action problem, action problem yes. that we have. Um, and we've got a couple of questions that I wanted to ask that are sort of uh, different variations of that. I actually, in a lot of the questions. So Katie asks, I've been advocating for civil discourse for a decade and a half, but often I feel like I'm shouting or rather speaking civilly into the wind. <laughs> how, how, how can we be quiet loudly? How can we grow the movement um, when the news and online environments are so sensationalist and so many people, and I think this is really true and it is a frustration we have, so many people are craving connection and thoughtful dialogue, but our dumb brains draw us towards clickbait and outrage. Yeah. How do we fight it when so many of us feel yeah. that way? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, and we, so, so what's a collective action problem? A collective action problem is a very common term in the social sciences where each of us does what we think is best for us, but that leads to a terrible outcome for us all together. So, you know, if each fisherman overfishes, he's better off, but then the next year, the, you know, the, the fishing stock is depleted and the whole community collapses. Um, and and so, especially for the parents in the audience, for anybody who, who's a parent who has a kid under 18 or certainly especially under 12, um, the only reason that parents give their kids a phone, I mean, at least for a lot of them, is because the kids said, mom, everyone else has an iPhone. And you gave me this, you know, this dumb watch or this this flip phone or nothing, um, and I'm being excluded. And no parent wants their kid to be a loner or excluded. So it's a collective action problem because we'd all be better off if no kid had a smartphone before high school. There's, I mean, it's horrible for you know we've we got to focus on middle school. That's where the maximum damage is done, especially to girls. Um, just get all this stuff out of the lives of middle school students, um, so we can solve the collective action problem um, if we if we all act together. Um, so, um, actually, uh, wait, let me just lay out the, the four norms to solve the collective action problem, and then we'll get to the, the, back to the answer to the question. So what I'm proposing in the book, I have give a lot of specific suggestions in the anxious generation for what parents can do, but four norms that are easy to do if we do them together and hard to do if we don't. Norm number one, no smartphone before high school, just give them a flip phone. Um, norm number two, no social media before 16. Um, they can have the rest of the internet. They can, you know, they can communicate in all kinds of ways, but they don't need a hyper viral platform like uh, Instagram. And they don't need um, a highly addictive short form video program controlled in part by the Chinese government. Um, so no social media till 16. Phone free schools. Every school K through 12 has to say, you put your phone in a locker or a yonder pouch in the morning, you get it back in the, in the afternoon. If you leave it in the pockets there and they're texting during class, literally they, and if some kids are texting then they all have to be on, they don't want to be the only one who doesn't know what's happened. So phone free schools. And then the fourth norm is far more childhood independence and free play. And this really comes from Lenore Skenazy and a project I have with her at let grow. If you go to letgrow.org, parents will find a lot of ideas to do at home or in schools. Um, so, you know, if you were the only one who sends your kid out, then you can get arrested or you'd be afraid. But if we're all sending our kids out to play in the afternoons, then actually everyone's better off. So those are the four norms to break out of the collective action problems. Now, I, I went through the time to do that because my answer to the questioner is, you know, there is a sort of, there are limits on what you can do as an individual because we're stuck in collective action problems. Um, but if you play your part to try to, uh, solve the collective action problems, well, then collectively, we can change this. We can really roll back the phone-based childhood and restore a play-based childhood. That would be gigantic. We all 
can play a part in that. Um, and uh, when the book launches, we're building a website right now at anxiousgeneration.com. We're going to have a pledge asking people, will you commit to doing your part to roll back the phone-based childhood and restore the play-based childhood? Um, now, as for civil discourse, that's that's harder. And the democracy problems are harder than the childhood problems. The childhood problems we can solve. Like if we do these four norms, this will actually, not entirely, but this will really roll it back quite away. Um, democracy problems are harder. And I think uh, as an individual, I think we, you know, you know, act, you know, we're, we're concerned nationally, but I think acting locally is really the main thing you can do. If you're a philanthropist, support places like the Village Square and and I should say, oh, Constructive Dialogue Institute. Uh, I would urge people to go to Constructive Dialogue Institute, uh, Constructive Dialogue dot org, um, and um, uh, and we we offer a, a a a program that literally teaches you a bit about moral psychology, how to start a conversation, how to be persuasive, um, and so. Oh yeah, so there you go. So there are all sorts of things you can do if you have any influence at your company or at a, at a high school or a university, um, assign uh, the Perspectives Program from Constructive Dialogue. Um, and uh, so yeah, there are all kinds of ways that you can magnify your impact. But if all you do is, is strengthen a few relationships in your community with your family, you know, if everyone did that, we wouldn't be in this situation. That's so, Corey, so I'm going to try to push through as many questions as I yeah. can in our limited You can see time. I have follow-ups, but yeah, go ahead. Yes, I would like to um, continue talking for the next eight hours, actually, <laughs> but we cannot. That's it? Um, <laughs> so, um, Kami Akavan, who is an extraordinary um, executive director at the USC Center for the Political Future, which is a great model for IOPs across the country, asked, should we be more focused on nudging leaders from the grassroots to trickle down pro-social behavior or trying to develop pro-social behavior and attitudes at scale at grassroots level? They're both important, but which do you think is more important? Yeah. Well, so as a social psychologist, I'm thinking about parameter changes in our society. Like what are the things that caused, you know, small changes? If you have a complex dynamical system and you do a small change in a parameter, you know, like if you have an ecosystem and you raise the temperature by three degrees per, you know, permanently, that's going to have huge impacts. So in terms of thinking globally, I'm thinking parameter changes. I'm thinking social media regulation, uh, you know, removing, you know, repealing Section 230. I mean, there are all sorts of things that would, ch you know, change parameters at, at, a, at a global level. Um, it's very hard to persuade at a global level. I mean, you know, it's very hard to persuade people using commercials, using political appeals, because people don't just like, like, oh, a message came into my ear and it has a certain structure and that's going to turn a key in my brain. It doesn't work that way. Um, we're not persuaded by an idea, by a, a communication. We're persuaded by a person or an interaction. And so, you know, no, I don't, I, I wouldn't put a lot into like big messaging campaign. I don't think that's going to do anything. So I would say, you know, globally look at parameter changes, locally look at at, at small scale, uh, you know, grassroots stuff. That's really helpful. Um, so Hen Henry McHenry uh, with the meeting of opposites, actually, I think that's in Charlottesville. Um, and he was at a talk that you gave recently. Uh, oh, yeah, can we week. save the culture by saving the university? Can we save the university without saving the culture? How connected mm. are they? Oh, that's a great question. So it's often said that culture is upstream from politics, but technology is upstream from culture. And so a lot of our political, pro our political problems are clearly very related to our cultural problems, obviously. And I've been arguing that our cultural problems are tightly linked to our technological change. The early internet was great. The, uh, the second wave of internet has destroy is destroying us, um, the social media era. Um, and, um, so in terms of universities, you know, I've been, I've been really alarmed at what happened since 2014, 2015, when we abandoned our, 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 our telos, our purpose, and became much more ideological. We lost the trust of America, not just of Republicans, but of centrists and moderates. And um, uh, we violated our fiduciary duties to the truth. Now, I think this is crucial in this conversation, because as I said before, you know, I think we're heading into an era which may have extraordinary material prosperity. And I think AI for a while is going to, could massively increase prosperity, but we're going into an age of sociological fragility and possible disaster. 
Mm. Uh, and again, I wish we had good. I mean, there are some actually there's interesting. There are some actually conservatives. There are a few conservative sociologists that are very concerned about them, like James Hunter at UVA, Christian Smith. Uh, there are a few. But um, um, uh, the we're going, you know, I'm trying to convey these really abstract sociological academic ideas to you, like about Emil Durkheim and about evolution. Like these are really hard things to understand and to convey. Imagine trying to go into this weird new world without any scholars or researchers, without universities that are doing their job. With you know, if the university are just focused on social justice, they're not they're not focused on truth, then we're flying blind. And so I feel like this is, you know, the way in World War II, the entire academic world in the US, the UK, everyone's like, okay, what can we do for the war effort? Um, I think we should be like that. Unfortunately, a lot of people are like, what can we do for the war against Trump effort? Now, again, I understand that. I think Donald Trump is a unique threat to the country. Again, I understand why people are voting for them. There's a lot to dislike about, about the left and what's happening. So I'm not judging people who are voting for him, but I do think that um, that he is a, a unique uh, uh, threat to the constitutional order, especially his recent marks about Russia can do whatever the hell they want to our allies. That was, I mean, uh, you know, what? Kind, how can it be that in our country this doesn't end your presidential race? But yeah. that's the kind of bespoke realities that we're in. Um, uh, but yeah, but we, we we need our universities not just to focus on the partisan war, but of course they should be studying it, but not be partisans in it. But yeah, we need them to understand what the hell is happening to us. Um, so, Corey, if you want to ask um, a, a last question, and then I've got a closing question I wanted to make sure I got to, and I'm going to break really quick to just say that before we close tonight, I wanted to ask you to take a look at the um, link that we're giving for the post survey in, in the chat window. Um, and if you could answer the questions while we're finishing up the program, uh, we'll also send you a link afterwards. You'll help us better understand political division. And we need both a pre and a post to make it all science-y. Mm -hmm. Corey. Yes. You, I'll steal from some of the questions that have been posed, uh, one of which was, what are our strengths as humans mm -hmm. that we can bring to the task ahead? Oh, I love that question. That, you know what, actually, wow, that actually gives me hope, that question. And the reason is because humans are amazingly adaptable creatures and the human advance, while it has not been perfectly steady, you know, I am a fan of Steve Pinker and, and uh, Robert Wright and others who pointed out that yes, there are setbacks, but the long-term trajectory has been up and up and up and it, and, and it probably will be, um, you know, I'm talking, there could be a period of extraordinary disruption. But the network era could, in theory, really could bring us the best democracy ever. I mean, the early internet seemed to promise that. We might be able to realize that. So, so what gives me hope about humans is that while we're amazingly complicated creatures, um, we are not fully selfish. We're actually very group-oriented, which can be good or bad, but it's usually good. Um, we are ethical creatures, not perfectly, but we care about it. Um, we're a miraculous species. I mean, how how humans made the jump from just forest dwelling primates to living in comfort with people of all races, creeds, and colors, not perfect harmony, but like, you know, in America, there's you know not much cross-racial violence. Again, things are getting worse because of social media. There are some issues, but um, so yeah, if you if you keep your eye on human nature and you don't deify it, you don't say, oh, we're all so loving, you know, but, but you say, you know, we're complicated, but look at how far we've come. And so even if we face some setbacks, probably we're gonna succeed in the end. So yeah, actually, yeah, that does give me hope. That reminds um, me real quick of the um, uh, East of Eden, uh, the one of the best Bible studies, if you ever wanna read it. And uh, Steinbeck comes to the conclusion that Genesis chapter four, when God speaks to Cain, he says, um, sin is crouching out the door and thou blank overcome it. And ultimately the conclusion that they come to is, it's not thou must overcome it as a command. It's not thou shall overcome it as a promise as some of our popular pastors, but thou mayest overcome it. The much more nuanced, oh, subtle uh, translation. You yeah. have the choice, you have the option. You, right. have to, you have to decide, yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, so my last question is kind of a riff on that. Um, 
I wanted to say to our audience that we you, you asked so many good questions. I could keep us here for another couple of hours <laughs> asking them. And so I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I want to I want to kind of come back to some of our colleagues again. You know, back when we started this work, there there was not very many people out there doing it. And now there's just yeah. an incredible network of humans that, yeah. you know, I I really think when I retire, I think I'm gonna write the story of of looking at them and the people who just like put their put their lives on hold, change their day jobs to start trying to work on this, which to me gives me so much hope. And um, one of them is Cheryl Gravy from a National Institute for Civil Discourse, a wonderful mm -hmm. colleague. And, and she wrote something today that I wanted to share um, that frames this last question. She wrote, I'll be listening for new possibilities for our humanity that may be emerging during this time of turbulence mm. and transition. I just thought that was a beautiful way to put mm, it. Right. Um, and we had a, a, so many questions about, you know, hope that humans can change and variations of hope. And then our um, colleague and friend, Dr. Jacob Hess asked, he's now um, staff writer at the Deseret News, which is doing just wonderful writing and work on the problem that we're all talking about tonight. Is there hope even if things do break down? A rebirth that you could envision made possible by the natural dissolution of systems and approaches that prove to be unsustainable, that aren't working. Oh, yes, yes. So let, let me let me expand on something I mentioned before, but it's very important for this conversation. I hope it'll be a direct answer. So there's a meme on the internet, which actually has a lot of social science behind it, which goes, um, hard times make strong men, strong men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make hard times. And every 80 years, and this is a theory from Stra uh, How, uh, How and Strauss, every 80 years since, you know, since the, well, even before the revolution, but certainly since the revolution, civil war, World War II, and the 2020s, 80 year cycles. Um, and what this is really doing, uh, there was a Muslim uh, scholar in the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, who talked about asadiyah, the binding force that keeps society together. You know, the, the Bedouins come sweeping out of the desert, they're tough, they take over. The children are rather comfortable. And then the grandchildren are really soft. And then, and then another group. Comes. So, so um, our grandparents or whatever built these extraordinary institutions of the post-war order. They went through hell. They went through depression. They went through war. They came out strong. They were incredibly good citizens comparatively. Um, and they built these institutions. But institutions decay. Times change. And every 80 years, things break apart and we have to come up with new ones. And... Americans did it after the Revolutionary War. They did it after the Civil War. They did it after World War II. And we're going to have to do it in the 2030s. Uh, I think things are going to, you know, things will probably get worse in the 2020s. And then we need to have a rebirth in the 2030s. So that's our challenge. And if history is a guide, it will we'll probably succeed. Now, of course, now there are many more threats that could have catastrophic effects that weren't present previously. Uh, but, um, you know, the odds are we're going to find our way through it. Um, that but, it's, I, your answer is making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure I can finish it. She's up, getting all verklempt, John. <laughs> what, what did you do, man? <laughs> uh, but I just, I just wanted to say, uh, Corey first. I love you, dude. Uh, I lo I love to hang out with you. Thank you for coming into our living room tonight to do this interview. And and John, I just, um, your thinking and your big heart. It's changed the world in ways that that I don't think I could ever um, really explain to the people on this call. Some of them know it, right? Because they've um, had the opportunity to interact with you that they, I th you know, you are such a busy man. The whole, the whole idea that you took <laughs> this time out to talk to us tonight, but you do it person by person and effort by effort. And I've seen you now do that for the 12 or 13 years that we've been hanging out. And I just, I cannot thank you enough. Um, I just cannot thank you enough. Oh. Well, 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 thank you, Liz. Um, it's been an honor and a, and a, and a joy to, to work with you. Um, I hope I can just, just say um, at the end here, I, I do hope that people will follow up by subscribing to my Substack after Babel. It's free. There's no paywall. You, you don't have to give me any money. But after Babel.com, um, that's where uh, uh, Zach Roush and I are publishing our research. That's leading up to the new book. I hope people will consider pre-ordering the new book, The Anxious Generation. Um, and I hope that people will just stay involved and do what they can. Um, most, so I'll leave it, you know, one thing I found over and over again, most people are reasonable. Um, 
you know, uh, what's going on is the dynamics are making it seem different and they're empowering other people who are not reasonable. Most people are decent. Most people are reasonable. Don't lose your faith in, in Americans. Be concerned about the dynamics that are messing us up. Someone said they hope that human nature will change. Don't hope that human nature will change. It's not going to change. Hope that we find better ways to live together that bring out the better sides of our nature. We know it's possible. We've done it. We can do it again. Um, well, we're getting I'm I'm getting comments that I'm not going to uh, share now, but lots of comments about just how profound your work has been. Um, so we'll share it afterwards. And um, thank you so much on behalf of Florida Humanities and the Village Square. We are so glad that you all joined us tonight. Good night. Thanks so much, Liz. Thanks so much, Corey.